Hey guys, it's 6.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, July 15th, in the said year, 2019. This video will probably just go under the title of the Hiding America videos I've been doing because um, it is going to be anchored in that same book by Schrag. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, I would imagine after I at least ad address this topic, um, I don't know that I'm I'm going to be continuing to pursue actively um, more materials you know, that would fit into that uh, category of hiding America. Although, just by default, a lot of my research just falls under that title as well. It, it's just that um, this, this book came along right at about the time that um, my eyes were getting better. And it wasn't so painful to read on a screen anymore. And then it just so happened this book fell into my lap. Um, I believe it was through the Phoenix Enigma website blog. And so it, it, it was so interesting that I consumed it because of the subject matter. Um, and also, I think, because of the assumptions. Uh, and then, furthermore, the assumptions that there are about America in general. The history, the geography, the people that came here um, and recorded um, what they saw and what they did. Uh, from the 15th century on, uh, again, I'm one of those very remote voices that will continue uh, to to keep saying over and over again um, that it's just, there. It's just insane to believe that first off that man did not have the ability to sail the world. <laughs> easily before the 15th century and that somehow they would have missed the Americas uh, for so long. But moving forward, if it, if it hadn't been for the chance finding of another book, I, I probably would have not really even addressed this too much. Other than uh, maybe a few key points, just to let everybody make up their mind, um, I am going to point out a few things um, that I'm sure will ruffle some feathers. There's no way around that. Um, so I just started s scanning the internet a little bit to see what was out there just concerning the death of Meriwether Lewis the opinions because I, I you know I really thought and this was this was one of the reasons that I wasn't even gonna put really any time into it it just seemed to me that anyone who all, all you had to do was was just read the existing facts concerning the Lewis death case. And I know that there is there's a lot of intrigue to it um, and potential complications that could be brought up and explored. Um, 
However, it, it does seem that um, even with what facts we have, that there is quite a preponderance of evidence in favor of him being murdered, <laughs> as opposed to this being a suicide. Because if it was a suicide, I suppose the... Um, if it was a suicide, the, the factors would be even more outrageous than to to look at it very straightforward as a murder. But then uh, the next question would be, uh, by whom and, and what was their motive? Unfortunately, it, it's... Even that is not quite as cut and dry as I, I believe some people would think it to be. Um, I think something rather unfortunate about Meriwether Lewis is the fact that so many white patriots and um, avid students of of history um tend to idolize lewis as a great american hero uh <laughs> i have no intention of denigrating him however i i think that so many of us are just right now, um, still in the stages of development concerning our worldview and our perceptions of history, that perhaps it would be productive to just rethink um, maybe some of our preconceived notions on Meriwether Lewis. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, anyone who has looked into names, they, they know that sometimes uh, names are, are dead ringers. If you're talking about um, overt external Jews, some are you know, very much right out in the open as Jews. And so the names are quite obvious. But then again, you have crypto-Jews. Now, some of their names have, uh, in recent times, become more obvious because enough researchers have shed enough light on their name-changing practices to make a number of crypto-Jewish names very uh, well-known and more obvious than they had been before. However, there are still a great deal of names that are held by crypto-Jews that you're simply not going to know that they're a crypto Jew just by the name because of, first off, the way that many of them took their names in Europe centuries ago when it was required for them to take a surname. Um, they would often do it based on uh, uh, one of a few basic criteria. It would either be... Um, sort of uh, landmarks or natural things, naming themselves after <laughs> mountains such as berg or types of trees, colors, uh, stones, <laughs> things like that. Or they would take them directly out of the Bible. And that's how you ended up with so many Cohens, um, even though it would be impossible for there to be that many Cohens. Um, and so many Levi's. The strange thing about Levi, and again, this is not an open and shut case uh, on this because of etymologies of names. 
Um, Levi, okay, if you look up, for instance, the French uh, derivation of Louis, L-O-U-I-S, um, or the, um, the derivation of that, Louis, L-E-W-I-S, you'll find that they can be traced back to Levi. That's the way that, you know, they are officially etymologized. Is this by everyone? I don't know, but it is a standard definition of, of the etymology of Lewis. Does that mean that everyone with the name Lewis has some sort of Jewry in the past? as opposed to an Israelite heritage. It doesn't. However, it is not beyond crypto-Jews to take the name Lewis. And we know that because to this day there are, uh, there are external and crypto-Jews with the name Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. That does not make Meriwether Lewis a Jew or crypto-Jew. Um, it's simply an illustration of names and the difficulty with them. Now, the French name Louis, L-O-U-I-S, is actually far closer to uh, biblical Israelitism than Jewry, which are night and day different. Because the tribe of the third oldest son of the first wife of Jacob, Leah, that son's name is not Levi. Levi is the Masoretic um, perversion of Louis. His name was Louis. So his children and that priesthood would be called Louim. Um, those who served as the high priest would have been called Ken. Um, not to be confused with the Kenites. The Kenites should have been called Kini. Those were descendants of who we call Cain. Luim, um, the high priests, not only of um, the temple of Yahweh, were called Ken. It was a type of descriptive name of a high priest. There were high priests of other peoples. Peoples who practiced um, pagan religions, they would call their high priest, in many instances, a ken also. Does this mean that the worship of Yahweh was similar or the same as pagan religions? So it doesn't prove that at all. No. Um, David was called by title a Melech. It is the same title as many other leaders of other nations and city-states around them. They were also referred to as Melech. So I just wanted to bring that name issue to light. And I want to stress it does not necessarily prove anything. You have to look at a preponderance of evidence to to prove something. Now, uh, also, I brought up in an older video how it was said that Meriwether Lewis was inducted into a local Masonic lodge <clears throat> and within 30 days was uh, made Master Mason and uh, very shortly after that was promoted even higher. That is of some interest, certainly. And I don't think that should be ignored, especially by researchers who are looking into the effects of hegemonic Jewry uh, against humanity and specifically against uh, the people called white people. Um, the strange thing about masonry, just to throw, I guess, a monkey wrench into everything here, the strange thing about masonry is this. 
that in the late 1700s, which is when Lewis was inducted into a local lodge and shortly thereafter made a master mason and so on, it was, it was only in about the 1790s, for instance, that John Robeson um, released his book, Proofs of a Conspiracy, or Proofs of Conspiracy, that <clears throat> uh, masonry and other reading societies, so what a reading society, well, for instance, a modern... Um, a form of a reading society would be like the John Birch Society. And I think it's actually a great illustration of, of this. What he was saying was, in the late 1700s, by then, he believed that a great deal of Masonic lodges had been infiltrated and were not what they formerly were. I don't know enough about masonry before the 1700s, uh, but I do know that they do seem to have had, in many instances, uh, different intents than what they came to be later on. There was a whole movement called Martinism, which seemed to be the vehicle or one of the vehicles of inserting Jewry into masonry. Um, Martinism, you can even Wikipedia Martinism, and you'll see that its emblem from centuries ago was a red version of what today is called the Star of David. Uh, so that seems quite obvious. Now, it would also seem quite obvious that by the late 1700s that masonry had been whatever it was before that, which I'm not in any position to tell you, certainly was uh, infiltrated uh, maybe completely because um, Many Masons, even Master Masons in Europe, were leaving and denouncing Masonry. Um, and I think that reached the Americas later, because we see a few decades into the 1800s that uh, things like, for instance, the anti-Masonic political party are formed. Um, so anyways, Lewis was inducted prior to these events. Um, even B'nai B'rith, which was a secret society born from Jewish Masons and Jewish, uh, Odd Fellows, which is a whole other society and a whole other story, um, was after, uh, the time of Lewis and his induction into the Masons. So it's hard to say. I'm not, um, I'm not clearing him. I'm not condemning him. Um, I am at this time just entirely unsure. Um, when you consider that, uh, you know, I mentioned these large breaks in his journals that um, they don't seem to be characteristic of one who was entrusted with such a, a great honor of this exploration. It doesn't seem characteristic. Um, and the fact that So many portions of his journals were, uh, as it were, lost to us for hundreds of years, two centuries before they were um, supposedly published in completion in the late 
1990s. Uh, and then you consider the fact that it seems like he was very desirous to publish his journals um, from the time that he got back, but there seemed to be issues. Uh, and that's kind of a head-scratcher, too. What issues? Issues with him? Um, was it he that was going through possibly editing, pulling large portions out that didn't seem like um, they needed to be known by the American public? Or <clears throat> was it that um, he had already been talking to editors of large publishing houses who were advising him to, to do certain things. Was it, um, was this a military operation? And, uh, you know, was it not entirely presided over by Jefferson? Was Jefferson, because of his financial issues was he indebted to certain people who specifically um, made the journals of Meriwether Lewis a um, a point of contention for them it's really hard to say but if you approach these issues with the idea that Jefferson and Lewis were a couple of spotless shining lights uh, in American history and at this time. I think that you stand the risk of missing a few things. Not that both of them don't seem to have very uh, good aspects to their characters. I'm not saying that. Uh, of course, um, Jefferson is, uh, you know, was an anti-federalist. He repealed the whiskey tax, which, by the way, Meriwether Lewis, when he went into the army, participated in the putting down of the Whiskey Rebellion. And the Whiskey Rebellion, of course, being the first excise tax, tax after the Constitutional Convention, which, of course, for some time I've been... I've been very skeptical, of course, of the Constitution. It seems like it's been used as an instrument uh, more against the people of the United States than for. Um, I know that some people would argue with that, saying, well, that it was simply the, uh, <clears throat> the ratifying and the breaking of the Constitution. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I really think if they came out with a Constitution or a document that allowed them to do the things they are doing today, uh, they all would have been hung as traitors. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't have been at that time, but, you know, the works of darkness, as those doing the works well know, have to be done incrementally. So, I've learned a lot about various things from the other book I ended up stumbling across in looking into Lewis. Um, that other book is entitled White Honor, Meriwether Lewis, A Modern Journalist and the Enemy Jews by James Thomas Laffrey. Now, this book is actually written as an autobiographical narrative taking place over about two years, from the summer of 96 through 98. And just given my taste in books, I'm a 
a very dry non-fictionalist. That's just what I like to read. So there was a great deal of narrative in here, which was personal autobiographical things. Um, and all of them, of course, uh, there was a point to it, of course. It's just that um, I was mostly looking for that material on Lewis and the hearings and proceedings that went on um, because the family, along with other interested parties, were really pushing for and filing for uh, exhumation rights on the body of Lewis so that some things could be determined about his death since it's still officially considered a suicide or a mystery, but a suicide nonetheless. And there are apologists to this day that still consider it a suicide. Many people are very upset about um, how he's made out to be a, a drunkard and uh, by, by the time of his death, uh, even out of his mind, not in his right mind, uh, there are those who <laughs> point out um, uh, the fact that the Lewis family um, was heavily intermarrying with, uh, I believe it was the Merriweather family, because that I think that was his mother's maiden name, unless I'm wrong. And it was that family that many of the Lewis family married with. And they would point out that, you know, there is a lot of mental derangement that goes on in such close marriages. But they, they fail to mention uh, how often these Jewish communities keep doing that to this day and how deranged many of them must be with so much inbreeding. Um, because that's the whole point. They do own the big newspapers, the parent companies, to even what seem like small independent companies. Now, that's, that's some of what Laffrey goes into in this book, which is very good. It's just the thing is a lot of that's peppered throughout, and then when you get to the end of the book, a lot of it's very concentrated at the end. Um, was still a good read, though. I uh, I read it in a few days, um, on top of all the other reading and, and other things that I do. So, some of what I'm going to talk about concerning his death is going to be from that. I'll try to go over some of the specifics to the uh, filing for exhumation and what happened with the Parks Service. But in all, I'll, I'll try not to make these portions of this information go on too long. Uh, now from Schrag in his book, The Suppressed History of America, it's in his last chapter, The Murder of Meriwether Lewis. He says, in June 2009, two centuries after his mysterious death, collateral descendants of Meriwether Lewis launched a website as part of a campaign to exhume and examine the explorer's remains. The announced goal was simple, use modern forensic techniques to determine once and for all whether Lewis died by his own hand or by someone else's. Lewis's family had worked for more than a decade to secure from the Federal National Park Service permission for the exhumation and proper reburial. The campaign encourages concerned Americans to write letters to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, which oversees the National Park Service, which controls the land in Tennessee, where Lewis is buried. So, there was over 140 still-living relatives of Meriwether Lewis who were petitioning for this, and they had leading experts um, in many fields, um, forensics, uh, geology, anthropology, that were with them, that got behind them. There were the three current governors of um, Missouri, Tennessee, and Virginia, 
at that time in the 90s that were behind this effort as well. They had local uh, district attorneys that joined this effort. Uh, they proved that ample evidence existed for believing it to be murder and for exhumation to be done so that um, there could be a, a proper um, inquest done on the matter. The, the president at the time of his death, James Madison, uh, was a very, very shady character, which the author of the other book I mentioned, White Honor, James Laffrey believes due to uh, a preponderance of evidence that um, Madison is actually a crypto Jew, was. Madison was one of the architects of the Constitutional Convention, which took us from the form of government, which at the time was the Articles of Confederation, which many believe were quite good, worked very, very well for us, and had a secret meeting, you know, just like we would uh, see the Bilderbergs uh, having. It was a secret meeting, you know, lock and key sort of secret meeting. Um and drafted this Constitution, which was not ever meant to uh, extend the states their rights that they were supposed to have, that they believed they would have under this uh, federation. Um, but instead, it seems to have been a document from its inception meant to in time completely strip the states of their rights and um, there are very few but there are uh, those who attended this convention who took copious exact notes on what went on and who advocated for this and how and I think they very adequately show it to be uh, a document designed to first off strip the states of individual rights um, and, and ultimately, you know, put the people back in subservience to slavery. <clears throat> you know, they started right after this by... Uh, imposing the excise tax on the whiskey uh, coming from the, the Western farmers. Um, and to them, oftentimes, like in the East, you know, tobacco was for a long time used as a currency. This was during colonial times for a very long time. And in the West, uh, whiskey was used as a currency. Uh, very heavily as a currency in, in Appalachia and in western Pennsylvania. So the excise tax on it and who imposed that, figures like Alexander Hamilton, um, believed again uh, by Laffrey to be another crypto-Jew. Uh, and I think a very good case can be made for Hamilton's crypto-Jewry. Uh, along with a number of uh, men involved in the government and the moving and shaking of the early United States, um, you know, I see their effects from centuries earlier. So to think that they were not uh, inf infesting the government by the late 1700s, you know, is uh, unreasonable. Well, so anyways, uh, Schrag continues that Lewis's family began to bang loudly a drum that has been beating consistently since Lewis's mysterious death at an inn along the historic Natchez Trace roadway. 
This renewed interest in Lewis's true fate has caused substantial uproar among historians, government officials, academics, and armchair experts as they review a patchwork collection of documents, reports, and various pieces of evidence. All continue to draw a variety of conclusions based on that same evidence. Some say Lewis committed suicide, succumbing to a lifelong battle with depression, bipolar disorder, alcoholism, malaria, syphilis, or some combination thereof. Um, by the way, if they exhumed the body, they had experts um, available who could do tests on the bones to determine whether or not he did have syphilis. There is a great deal that they could have discovered from these bones, and they really could have put the matter to rest. Now, what had happened was, at some point in time, probably some corrupt governor or officials of Tennessee uh, and Mississippi decided to donate the Natchez Trace Parkway and a large amount of ground, basically, on either side of it to the National Park Service, the federal government, because, you, of course, you always want to put important things in their hands, right? Well, it ends up that the monument or grave marker of Meriwether Lewis is within those bounds. So it's the National Park Service that has had dominion uh, over it, so they had to go to them. And it turned out to be such a fiasco. Um, anyone after, I would say, just reading the events that transpired in uh, the guy who was really leading the effort to do this was uh, named James Stars. He was a professor in Washington, D.C. And uh, it is amazing when, when you look at just the sheer will of the National Park Service. Um, ideas like people writing letters to them... Uh, to me, it just seems like a waste of the people's time because the National Park Service, just like any other branch of the federal government, is determined in their audacity and hatred of the American people, the American white European descended people, because of who run most of all of the branches of the federal government. Um, they're more than happy to extend the middle finger to all of us. I, I don't see how, but this is in the 90s that they're, you know, we're pushing this website. I don't see how any of that um, is going to do a darn bit of good. Uh, none of those things. And people are starting to get the idea. That's one of the things that you're going to see, uh, should any of you choose to read this book by Laffrey is that he, through his own experiences, had to come to understand who the, the real enemy of white Americans are and humanity in general. And I think it's pretty clear that what they went through with the National Park Service, entities of the government, so on and so forth, um, was just another brick in that wall. And many people... Uh, are coming to terms with this. Um, and it's going to reach a critical mass where enough people are coming to terms with this. And then from that point forward, it's going to have to be, um, it's then going to have to be, so now what are we to do about this? Because um, and that's obviously the next step. So, there wasn't much that was done concerning um, what any reasonable people could do to try to get the body exhumed. And it was met with just downright uh, screw yous from the National Park Service. And it would appear that just about everybody involved 
in the official hearings uh, on the other side of this were influenced in some way or another to make this thing essentially impossible to see happen. Um, a lot the, the 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 figures that, by the way, bring up uh, a lot of these things about like depression, bipolar, uh, syphilis, <laughs> the inbreeding and everything. Um, they definitely are the they definitely all follow a, a certain sort of script, you know as if they were all issued a certain script to follow. And those who have done major TV presentations on this tend to follow that same script. So that has to make one wonder as well. Why don't they want the body exhumed? And what is it about uh, him or, or being determined as being murdered? Do they not want to come out? Uh, is that something that is just as potentially dangerous to them as large portions of his journals were? Good questions. Um, he continues, others are certain bandits murdered him, and yet others are equally certain that he was murdered as part of a, an assassination plot carried out by high-ranking officials of the burgeoning U.S. government. If one thing is clear, it's that Lewis's death has come to represent a growing distrust of American history as presented and popularized. Uh, I would agree. And uh, Laffrey would be one who believed in the uh, conspiracy of U.S. officials. Uh, Madison, there were some figures out west around Missouri, St. Louis, uh, that rightfully so have been fingered as being uh, dark characters in all of this, worthy of suspicion. Uh, Schrag continues, Lewis was just 32, 32 years old when he returned from the landmark exploration. The celebrations following the adventurer's return masked the fact that Lewis had returned to an America rife with political turmoil. I think it was rife with political turmoil for, for some time before he left. I believe it was rife with political turmoil. Upon returning, Lewis and Clark did not waste time in traveling east to debrief President Thomas Jefferson. The explorers were welcomed as heroes wherever they went and spent weeks touring, testifying, and receiving royal treatment. Yeah, they were the, the, the biggest heroes at the time. There were a lot of people that really believed that if Lewis had just continued on in life, it, it wouldn't be long before he was elected president. Uh, and very quickly, in fact. He, had, he was that popular. I mean, he was a rising star. He was, not, he was not on his decline. So the idea of depression and, and all these other things, they're pretty insane when you consider that he was still a rising star. I mean, he had a lot of opposition uh, out west, truly. A lot of intrigue, a lot of seedy things going on out there, which continued to go on uh, up until the days of Joseph Smith and his band trying to wage war on Missouri, and that's a whole other story, and that's one of the reasons I don't have the time to do a whole lot of a hard investigation into this matter. Um, however, he continues, following a string of celebrations and official inquiries, Jefferson rewarded the explorer's accomplishments with instant appointments to high political office. This is, this is true, and it is one of the factors that, to me, kind of what was a bit suspicious because that is something that I've seen done for people who are credited with exploring or finding uh, a lot of artifacts in, say, the Mideast that uh, I find to be highly dubious 
fines. These individuals, just a couple few of them, were very quickly awarded high political office. Um, and that seems to be one of those uh, typical sort of payoffs or benefits for... Now, I mean, could it be a payoff simply for job well done? Um, I don't know. It are, you know, a couple of young explorers who were uh, simply captains in the army before the exploration um, worthy of such uh, office appointments? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, what does it take to govern? Um, is it the same as what it takes to uh, go on a highly politicized adventure? Their core of discovery seems to be um, seems to have been uh, heavily publicized. Uh, it seemed like somebody or somebody's uh, very much wanted this to capture America's imagination. So. Uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about those appointments to political office. I, I don't know. Make, make what you want of it. He says, as we know, Lewis was named governor of the tumultuous Upper Louisiana Territory, and it was. Clark was appointed brigadier general of the militia and superintendent of Indian affairs for the same re region, serving alongside Frederick Bates, who will come up again uh, as we go on. Uh, who Bates was named uh, the Secretary of Upper Louisiana Territory to serve under Lewis. Clark and Bates quickly left for St. Louis to begin their work. In turn, Lewis left to wrap up some business in Philadelphia, where he intended to publish volumes and volumes of journals uh, recorded by the Corps of Discovery during the journey. Lewis searched for a publisher and began looking for artists to illustrate the compiled works. The journals and field notes remained in St. Louis, waiting for Lewis to arrive and prepare them for publication. Oh, all of that seems strange to me. Uh, I would have hoped he left them in extremely safe keeping as they went eastward to debrief the president. Strange that he wouldn't bring them with him. Uh, one, it is. Uh, the other is they're saying he was looking for publishers, but as publicized as their journey was, I would think publishers would be tripping over themselves to get in line um, to offer publication to him. Um... Same with illustrators, but I guess you could say, you know, they wouldn't necessarily know he would want an illustrator, so on and so forth. That is something that a publisher, uh, I would think, would take care of, too. Just some things about this that, um, to me, seem odd, I suppose. Uh, but maybe they're not. Um, official records of Lewis's life during the next four months are sparse. A letter from Lewis to an old friend, Malin Dickerson, suggests that Lewis spent time celebrating and socializing during his stay in Philadelphia, and that he may have sparked a romance and proposed marriage to a woman he met there. Lewis later returned to Virginia and made a round of official visits while hosted by President Jefferson at the White House. He also... <laughs> He also visited with his mother, Lucy Lewis Marks, uh, details of his time in Virginia and there. Some scholars speculate that he attended the treason trial of Aaron Burr in Richmond, Virginia at Jefferson's request. <clears throat> it is pretty odd that he seems to go off the radar for four months, too. Uh, they say that... Uh, Clark and Bates head straight out to the Upper Louisiana Territory to start their 
uh, duties there, and he yet meanders, they believe, around Pennsylvania for some time. Uh, he might have attended the treason trial of Aaron Burr. Another strange thing there, too. And uh, Laffrey comments quite a bit on Burr. You can tell that uh, he had about as much disgust for Burr as he did for Hamilton. Uh, really weird situation there. Hamilton and Jefferson were said to be, you know, arch rivals. But um, then Laffrey also claims that Jefferson and Burr were great rivals. He claims that Burr was as much of a traitorous wretch as Hamilton. Uh, and apparently their duel uh, was essentially a disagreement just between two rotten individuals as opposed to a, a duel of, say, a, a more pure-hearted guy against a, a, quite a wicked man, which um, I would have to say I, I don't think it's a stretch for anyone to regard Hamilton as just a a slave of of the banks, um, quite likely a crypto Jew, um, as rotten as you know guys like Washington, um, which I know is another thing that would come to you know a sh come as a shock to quite a lot of people. But sure, I think Washington was a uh, a wretched character as well. He continues, on March 8, 1807, a full year after he was awarded the position, Lewis arrived in St. Louis to begin his appointed duties as governor of Upper Louisiana. That's a full year after he was awarded his position. His mysterious absence has never been satisfactorily explained. A letter from Jefferson sent during the interim suggests that he was frustrated and concerned about Lewis's absence. The letter dated July 17, 1807 reads, quote, Since I parted with you from Albemarle in September last, I have never had a line from you, nor I believe has the Secretary of War with which you have much connection through the Indian Department. Expressing concern about publication of the expedition journals, he wrote, quote, We have no tidings yet of the forwardness of your printer. I hope the first print will not be delayed much longer. So it is, it's strange, or it seems strange, all of these delays at getting the journals printed, him going off the radar as he did for as long as he did. Uh, now, what's really weird is the sort of mail delays that there were in these days. Uh, I don't think people, because of our crap education system, which was all... Uh, designed to not only make us stupid, but make us completely unaware of what the real situation in America and the world is. Um, gave, <laughs> sort of gave us this idea that uh, from the time of the drafting of the Constitution, America was uh, just a place of such sparkling... Uh, wonderful ideas and oneness of the people and, and nothing could be further from the truth. It, it was a tumultuous place from its inception forward. Um, and if you don't understand the characters and the intrigue, uh, you're, you're never going to understand why it was such a tumultuous place and uh, a lot of the intrigue that went on here. Lewis is reported to have taken on his duties as governor with enthusiasm, but he struggled to manage the chaotic political circumstances he had inherited. 
Secretary Bates is characterized as having it in for Lewis, who he considered a political rival and perhaps usurper of his rightful role as governor of the Louisiana Territory. It is said to have worked hard to, he worked hard to undermine Lewis's efforts as governor. Bates may also have harbored some resentment towards Lewis. Years earlier, Bates had applied to become Jefferson's private secretary, but Lewis was chosen instead. Yeah, <laughs> this had kind of happened a couple of times now to Bates, where Lewis basically got the job that Bates wanted. Uh, really kind of a tough string of coincidences uh, with Bates, if they were coincidences, when the same guy keeps taking the job that you want. <laughs> uh, you could see that in... Uh, in him feeling uh, definitely spurned in some way or another, and Lewis being sort of the the cause or the centerpiece of him being screwed. Uh, Schrock continues, Meanwhile, references to his efforts and letters exchanged between Jefferson and other leaders suggest that Lewis developed a drinking problem. Uh, other letters mark his occasional melancholia, which may many observers suggest was a reference to clinical depression or late stages of syphilis. Uh, so syphilis. Now this is this is of course a main point. It is a claim that a certain many would consider a certain degenerate author keeps suggesting concerning him. Now this is again, I'll repeat myself, something that they may have been able to prove by skeletal condition in the exhumation depending on when he got it. If he contracted syphilis it would have most likely been because he was having sex with um, an Indian. Now here's the thing about syphilis. So, it is a very unwell-known fact that um, syphilis is attributed to the exploration of Christopher Columbus, a crypto-Jew. Um, Columbus's whole exploration was led by a band of crypto Jews and they are the ones uh, attributed to bringing syphilis back from the Caribbean the areas they visited uh, because of their sex with the natives and of course uh, again projecting what they do onto white Europeans it's always blamed on Spaniards or Portuguese as um, having so much sex with the uh, indigenous populations of the Americas and their islands when in fact it turns out that typically it was these crypto Jews who were so avid to have so much sex with the native population. Do what you want with that. This is why you have so many names of, um, for instance, uh, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, other islanders, Central Americans, and Southern Americans, which are the exact surnames of um, Sephardic Jews. Lopez is a perfect example, who was the name of one of the Jews on Columbus's uh, voyage. So he says, when James Madison became president in 1809, Jefferson's cabinet was replaced, and Lewis's great ally was no longer able to lend presidential support. Madison's appointment or appointed Secretary of War, William Eustace, complicated efforts in Louisiana by refusing to pay expense vouchers. Lewis is said to have paid government expenses from his own pocket, spiraling downward into severe financial trouble. 
Again, part of that is fact, part might be speculation, in fact. Um, I, it's interesting that Shrag is kind of uh, touting some of the uh, more obscure narratives. Uh, however, as I told you, he really keeps up, um, even though he's, you know, supposedly writing this book about you know, the suppressed history of America and, and yada yada and so on and so forth, he still really supports um, certain detrimental narratives throughout this book. Uh, he continues, in fall of 1809, Lewis made a special trip to Washington to settle his disputes with the War Department and to revive efforts to publish his journals. Lewis left St. Louis by boat on September 4th, 1809, with plans to travel to Mississippi, to New Orleans, and then travel by sea to Washington, D.C. Reports from Fort Pickering commander Captain Gilbert Russell suggest that Lewis's health and mental stability were deteriorating. After he arrived at Fort Pickering near Memphis, Tennessee, Russell relayed that members of the boat crew reported that Lewis had twice attempted to kill himself. Russell was allegedly so alarmed at Lewis's condition that he refused to let him leave until his health improved. During that time, Lewis decided to travel to Washington by land. Lewis said he changed his plans because he was afraid his expedition journals would fall into the hands of the British at sea. His plan was to leave Fort Pickering for the Natchez Trace, a rough road that stretched 450 miles from Natchez, Mississippi, to Nashville, Tennessee. From there, Lewis could take the road to Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, that's interesting. Now, based on all of the excerpts I've read from the journals. Uh, I guess I'm not a hundred percent sure why Lewis considered them a matter of like uh, high national security where he was very worried about them falling into the hands of the British which would have been probably quite likely once they entered the Gulf because of the um, English's presence uh, around the Caribbean and Gulf South Florida Triangle <clears throat> and they still had uh, at that time probably the best Navy in the world. I don't know if it would have been because of the mapping of that river, which he wouldn't have wanted them to know. Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> you know, I've seen so many older Spanish and French maps uh, <laughs> of North America and I don't know. I guess other than what mapping and naming they did of various river systems through there, perhaps they wouldn't want them to have that knowledge. Uh, that could be. Sure. Um, I just, in my, I, I suppose in my ignorance, in my naivete, um, would think that there were many other matters which would be considered of much higher priority national security wise <clears throat> than everything that I've come to understand that the Lewis and Clark journals contain. Okay, so again, you, you can make what you want of that. What I'm implying is that before somebody got a hold of these journals, and I think somebody did, uh, I think that's part of what was ransacked amongst his belongings 
uh, at the Griner Inn, not Grinder. We're going to find out that it was actually the Griner um, in Tennessee. So, yeah, I, I think his journals were probably far more complete. As I mentioned before, it, it seems odd that such huge gaps of time uh, would appear to be lost. Um, and I think that uh, his journals, amongst other documents, were ransacked, large portions taken. Uh, perhaps he tried to publish uh, long before this when he was in Philadelphia and Virginia. Um, perhaps certain publishers who were on the inside track suggested after reading the journals, well, they say what, he left them back in St. Louis? I mean, how do you, that just seems strange to me. I don't know if that's an error by Schrag, if that's an error by historians, or if that's in fact true. Um, perhaps I don't know. He just went over some of the basics with the publishers. They gave him some suggestions. They would have gotten a, a very good feel for what was going to be going in there. That seems very strange to me. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that because I had forgot about that little point of information that it is said that he left his journals back in St. Louis. Really weird. Really weird. Um, but, okay, <clears throat> as I said, again, he might have left them, you know, for safekeeping uh, once he got to a place that he considered to be at least far more secure than the road they took to the Pacific. So I do have to wonder what sort of sensitive information was in those journals and what other kinds of sensitive information he was carrying with him. Because there was a lot. I mean, it's definitely not a stretch when they say that um, he was assigned to a territory that was really uh, upside down <laughs> by then. That is not even remotely a stretch. Um, yeah, sure. I I'm I'm I will I will probably cut this off when yeah when it gets to the you know Griner stand because uh that and then the uh requests to exhume and a lot of the intrigue all over the country uh from east and west and in between I think is worthy of a another video, but uh, it says while I continue compulsory recovery at Fort Pickering, Major James Neely, agent to the Chickasaw Nation and a close ally of Wilkinson. Those are two names you're going to want to remember. They'll, they'll come up again and again. Neely and Wilkinson. Neely arrived at the fort and agreed to travel with Lewis. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, it seems like he really imposed himself on Lewis, but by then Lewis's health was reported to have improved enough for him to travel. Lewis left Fort Pickering with Neely and two servants. One of them, John Pernier, was Lewis's personal servant. The other, an unnamed black man, was Neely's travel companion. Shortly after an optimistic departure, Neely reported that Lewis's health had begun to deteriorate. The party rested at the Chickasaw Indian Agency and then continued on towards Nashville on the morning of October 10th. 
Neely stayed behind to look for some horses that had strayed, while Lewis and the others went on ahead. That evening, Lewis's party arrived at Griner's, not Grinders, it's uh, Griner's stand, a roadside inn about 70 miles southeast of Nashville. Lewis and his travel companions checked in with the intention of waiting for Neely. Early the next morning on October 11th, Meriwether Lewis died in his room from two gunshot wounds and what appears to be a series of knife wounds. Correct. <laughs> two gunshot wounds and a series of knife wounds. And they've got the gall to call it suicide. So, I guess when all the knife wounds didn't work, two gunshot wounds. And what one of the things that I guess the general observer doesn't realize is the caliber of bullets used in guns at this time. They, they were huge. Um, and not just rifle um, or musket balls. And musket balls were big. But even the uh, handguns, the pistols at the time, they were using a ball whose uh, caliber <laughs> was over a half inch. Um, <laughs> this ball shot into any part of a man. Uh, it's going to be game over. Unless you're shooting your pinky off. Th this size of a ball going into somebody. There's just no way for you to shoot yourself with the intention of suicide. Have it not work. And then even have the ability to reload this uh, flintlock sort of pistol. It required two different kinds of powders um, because it had one type of fine powder <clears throat> in the fire pan, <coughs> excuse me, in the fire pan, and then a coarse powder uh, that would be rammed down with the ball. Um, so it would take a minute, typically, to do. And this, um, it would, you know, the, the fire pan that would ignite the coarser powder and cause the ejection of the, the ball, um, it had to be ignited with the flint uh, on the, the cap, and that oftentimes didn't work first time. Sometimes you might have to pull it a few times to get that, get it to work. And you better make sure that powder is good and dry too. The oil on your hands can affect it, can cause it, you know, multiple strikes. It's just, there's a lot to it. So calling it a suicide with that much going on with this guy is, it's not crazy, it's stupid. It's stupid. It is something that, who's going to believe it? Certainly the specific details couldn't have been widely publicized. I wouldn't think at the time because <clears throat> I wouldn't think anybody would believe it. it would, it's, and, and that's the other thing that's really weird. It's hard to believe that such a national hero... Uh, wouldn't have had a serious, serious outcry, lest there was enough to this conspiracy to where, for a very long time, it was just 
chalked up as suicide and not much of the details of it were widely circulated. But we'll find out more uh, as this goes on. Again, this isn't this probably isn't going to reveal a lot in the same lines as like, you know, the other portions uh, of that book. I just felt that after reading this and then after reading uh, Laffrey's book and soaking up everything about the efforts that they tried to go through for exhumation. And then when you read... Um, I guess sort of everything that that Laffrey uh, went through to get to his understanding uh, of the Jews uh, as the enemy of, of humanity and most particularly of who were called whites. Um, it's interesting enough for a couple of videos on it. <clears throat> and as I said, I'll probably just put this in the same uh, Hiding America series because that's fine as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then I'm hoping to do a few things after that. One of them being um, to perhaps just read from um, the document No Treason by Lysander Spooner, Lo No Treason number six, where he completely deconstructs all the assumptions of the Constitution. And he did this only what, about 30, 40 years after it was drafted in secret by the uh, Constitutional Committee. So I think that should be interesting, uh, as well as uh, some of the information on that from Laffrey. Perhaps a good segue will be done from um, hiding the physical and geographical evidence of the continent of America to um, really the inception of enslaving America, Americans, uh, and the states. So we'll see how that goes. Till next time, take care, everybody.